Hi class, and welcome to um, our Renaissance section. It's gonna be the first section of the semester, um, and we're starting approximately around the year 1500, and we're gonna move um, you know, forward into the centuries from here, um, migrating closer towards the modern day, right towards the end of our weeks. But um, so far, we're gonna be starting um, at the Renaissance, uh, and after this uh, chapter, we're gonna be going towards the rise of nation states. And so here we're going to be seeing during the Renaissance um, how, you know, past the medieval ages, Europe is trying to grapple with, uh, you know, coming out of the quote unquote dark ages, right? Um, grappling, you know, uh, dynamics from the church, um, different intellectuals, right? And human thought. Uh, and slowly but surely, we're going to see them kind of uh, wrestle away from uh, let's say the clutches of the church, right, or heavy influence from the church, where um, God is uh, law, the church, and the priests, and the uh, you know, um, all the members of the clergy are law. And slowly, we're going to start seeing that people are getting more invested in human nature, um, you know, reason, uh, reasonable thought, logic, uh, even within their paintings, right. Uh, and, you know, their literature. So we're going to start to see, you know, a renaissance, right? A kind of rebirth of information and knowledge, right? So it's super exciting. Uh, and, you know, these changes during this period of time have reverberated throughout history. Uh, and a few of them are still impactful today, right? So it's interesting to kind of look at that. Uh, so let's start here. So some topics to consider for this section. Uh, and I might break this lecture up into um, two different, you know, uh, you know, lectures, if you will. Um, I'm not exactly uh, sure yet. We'll see how long it runs. So it might be a part one, part two to this, or I could just finish all of it, right? It really just depends. But uh, some topics to consider for this entire chapter section. Number one, Italy's resurgence of Greco-Roman culture or antiquity. So if anyone took uh, my early world history class before, right, detailing anything from the Neolithic era, right, ancient Egypt, Greece, Rome, uh, moving forward uh, toward the year 1500. Uh, the Renaissance starts with this resurgence of Greco-Roman culture, right, and we'll see what that means, uh, what does Greco-Roman culture even mean, uh, why is that impactful towards our Renaissance sections in Italy. Number two, uh, Italy's city-states and rise in trade. So during this time, Italy was in a very advantageous position. Uh, they were uh, located in the center of the Mediterranean. They were uh, at the crossroads, most importantly, at the crossroads of trade. And, you know, it allowed for various city-states to grow immensely in wealth and, you know, we had certain families and patrons that were, you know, wealthy as gods, and they were able to just, you know, divvy out their money and support the arts and build governmental buildings. And some of them had even more power than the uh, the governors themselves. Right. So interesting times here. Uh, number three, humanism and philosophy is coming alive. So in conjunction with the Greco-Roman culture being remembered and kind of brought back into the fold of society, we start to see that people are thinking even more deeply about humanistic thought, different philosophical ideas, um, you know, considering heaven versus hell. Uh, we're going to look into Dante's Inferno. Uh, and in conjunction with society moving away from the grasp of the church, uh, where the church is law and whatever they say goes, uh, humanistic thought is holding the human being in higher regard, right? And so, you know, forming uh, different paintings and ideas and literature uh, on the human being themselves, of the being the utmost importance, instead of we are here only to worship God, as the church has told us for the last few hundred years, right? So it's a complete shift in uh, sociological thought here. Uh, number four, kind of in conjunction with number two, but with the rise of all of the trade, um, a certain um, um, certain ruling families, such as the Medici, are going to grow in prominence immensely. Um, they are going to become so wealthy 
Um, they're going to become one of the wealthiest families, not only in Italy, but all of Europe uh, and the known world at this time. Uh, and what happens when your family uh, is rolling in money and they love art? They start to invest in artists, right, and sculptors and everything of the such. So that's why we're seeing during this Renaissance period this explosion of art and sculptures, right, and all of these works because you know it takes time to create these beautiful works of art and so getting that financial funding is crucial uh, number five renaissance literature and its intertwined nature between greco-roman heritage and new age ideals so we're going to look at a few uh literature pieces uh you know how the uh printing presses uh you know had any type of effect during this time as well and have a general discussion of the rise of reading the rise of literature uh, and just a general overarching question for us to ask ourselves during this section. What was the Renaissance? How it changed Italian culture? And what kind of societal and artistic contributions did they lay down? Why is it important for us to learn about the Renaissance? Why are we still learning about it? Uh, so it is the foundation of Western civilization, um, of European history, and you know, arguably the reverberations of some of these inventions uh, still stick with us right today. So part one, Greco-Roman heritage. So to understand Greco-Roman heritage, um, we'll dip a little bit back into the uh, uh, ancient times slash the medieval period to kind of give us some type of perspective, right? Because you can't really understand what is the renaissance or what that time period entails unless you can compare it to what came before right so for the longest time um going back in ancient history right we had the greeks dominate uh mediterranean culture the romans as well with the roman empire um all the religious beliefs their cultural beliefs their uh their gods their sculptures artworks etc uh after the greeks and the romans had their heyday uh, they, you know, went down in prominence, and the medieval ages, or the dark ages, quote-unquote, began. Uh, and so this period of time saw Greco-Roman knowledge, culture, uh, the scrolls, everything from those centuries of Greek and Roman kind of expansive power, uh, pretty much lost. Uh, the, the, re the amount of people who were uh, literate dropped immensely. The church and the clergy kept uh, an enormous amount of power to themselves. Uh, most of the people that were still literate were either high up nobles or, you know, just high up clergy members. And so, you know, this period of time, uh, the Greco-Roman heritage culture was not large at all. But as we're getting closer toward 1500, and like we said, there was this kind of push back and pull away from the church uh, during the 1400s because uh, many high up cardinals, many high up popes uh, started to get into scandals. Um, they started to enact legislation and uh, pass rules saying you can buy your way into heaven. You no longer needed to be a perfect Christian. You could pay for your entry into heaven. And so being a peasant or a serf or a farmer, right? Somebody that for your entire life, you were a you know, hardy Christian. Uh, hearing some of these things really made you consider, you know, why, you know, why am I so, you know, involved? Uh, does this make sense? And so, you know, slowly we're going towards the Renaissance, which in the French means rebirth, right? Uh, and so they started to regain their knowledge of the Greco-Roman heritage. They started to find all of these scrolls and all of these mappings and drawings and uh, inventions right and these works of art and reading about uh, ancient greek and roman historians and philosophers and plato and socrates and all of this stuff that for a couple centuries nobody had really picked up or read because the church kind of guarded it like they're kept secret uh now has just you know kind of brought forth this new wave of knowledge and so the greco-roman heritage is any bit of the language, the culture, the government, religion, any of that aspect coming from the ancient Greeks and the Romans. Uh, and so uh, the medieval period itself was pretty solidified in the, uh, the church holdings, um, very feudalistic in nature. Uh, feudalistic meaning that 
if any of you are like Game of Thrones fans, right? It's very similar to that. My lord. Hello, my lord, right? And so you have people working under a kind of like hierarchical pyramid structure where there's a lord sitting up top, the nobles, the royalty, and then everyone kind of filters down from there. It's very set and stable. The Renaissance started to be that rebirth. Um, they started to uh, develop their arts, their knowledge of Greco-Roman culture. They started to flip that entire narrative of you have to worship God, you, um, you know, be part of the church, be part of that hierarchical structure underneath your lord. All of that started to get flipped on top of its head. Uh, and so the Renaissance truly was a rebirth. And so the Renaissance itself was a great flowering of culture. Uh, it started, you know, in the late, I guess, 1300s, you could say. Um, but eventually, by 1400s, uh, the late 1400s, and especially uh, up to 1500, it really started to spread throughout Europe as well. And it began that renewed vigor of classical knowledge from Greece, from Rome. Uh, after the after the Roman Western Roman Empire fell, a little bit more on, uh, I guess, the history side, uh, there was a huge split. So for any of you fans of like the movie Gladiator or any fans of ancient Rome, uh, the Roman Empire used to stretch from the west and Britain and Spain all the way to the east, uh, you know, towards Egypt and the eastern Mediterranean. Uh, at a certain point, though, they had a split. Western and Eastern Rome kind of split down the middle. Uh, and Western Rome uh, ended up falling in 476 AD uh, due to the barbarians or the French and the Gallic and the German tribes, uh, you know, kind of hammering at the gates, right? And so militarily, the Western Roman Empire just could not stand all of that might, and so they ended up falling. But the Eastern Roman Empire, uh, which later on they would call themselves the Byzantine Empire, they continued that model of you know Rome. They were the inheritors of Rome. They were the last Romans left. Uh, and so the Byzantine Empire, which was uh, consolidating into today Greece, Anatolia, uh, which is Turkey, um, all of the Levant, uh, modern-day Palestine, Jordan, Israel, going into uh, Egypt as well, all of that kind of eastern territory of the Mediterranean, they were still in control of. And they were fantastic keepers of knowledge. They had all of the scrolls left over from the Greco-Roman heritage. And so uh, some people might say, well, if Rome fell in 476 AD, how in the heck, a thousand years later, in 1500, this Renaissance emerged? is because literally for a, you know almost a thousand years, the Byzantines kept up the traditions. They had an enormous amount of wealth, of prosperity. Um, their libraries were famous throughout the known world. And so because of that, they were the keepers of the knowledge. And once the Renaissance around 1400s, 1500 started to really propagate, that information was saved. Um, because you know information was easily lost back in the day. Scrolls could crumble, they could be burned, stolen. So it really, you needed a concerted effort to keep this up. And this just uh, is a map and visual representation of what I'm talking about. So the Western Roman Empire, as you can see, it was completely conquered and broken up by all of these various um, kingdoms, right? The Gallic kingdoms, the Germans, etc. Right? They came in with ferocity and they just overwhelmed them. The Eastern Roman Empire remained, and they kept um, the traditions alive for a thousand years or more. Um, they truly uh, kind of stood the test of time. Right? Uh, I I have a couple of videos here to show, but I'm not going to actually play them uh, because I'm not sure how the YouTube algorithm is actually gonna market or flag it or whatever because this is just for educational purposes but um, if you have time please go through and kind of backtrack on my lectures and watch these videos because it'll really give you that complete uh, experience right and so on the left hand side um, it kind of details the rise and fall of Western Rome and all the barbarians pounding at the gates as I said um, and on the right hand side is it from a TED talk or from TED Ed not necessarily TED talk but they do a fantastic job detailing how the Byzantine Empire uh, rose, how it uh, maintained its power structure for hundreds of years, right? Centuries, um, huge marvel. Uh, and eventually how they ended up faltering uh, towards the very, very end. 
uh, once the Ottoman Turks started to come in from the east. Uh, and inevitably, in 1453, Constantinople was uh, conquered, and the Ottomans stormed in and renamed Constantinople Istanbul. And today we have modern-day Turkey. So for, for my Armenian peeps in the class, uh, right, that is a fascinating piece of history. So please go through and watch the Byzantine Empire, right? Uh, moving through. We cannot have a discussion of the Renaissance unless we talk about art, right? Now, I am no art historian. That is a complete separate, uh, you know, different genre of academic uh, studies and thought, but I will do my best in terms of historical context. Uh, now, let's talk about classical art. And by classical, I mean going from that Greco-Roman heritage. So if you lived within ancient Greece or Rome, uh, classical art was the heyday, right? If you visited any museums here in Los Angeles, like the Getty Villa, the Getty, uh, the Norton Simon in Pasadena, right? All these uh, wonderful museums, uh, you know, they would have these beautiful marble or white, uh, you know, Greek or Roman statues, right? And so, uh, you know, all of the artistry that came from this time period, from the sculptures, the murals, the pottery, the mosaics, uh, it, you know, kind of fed into this classicism, right? This period of time during the classical era where people were, um, you know, showing uh, through their art form, their devotion towards their gods and goddesses, um, portraying their own lives and, you know, the lives of their famous civic leaders who they were following, right? Uh, and so, some of the characteristics of all of this art form was that it was supposed to be balanced and harmonious. Uh, figures were more often idealized to be more perfect than showing what was happening in the real world, right? So your proportions and your facial structures and your nose was kind of the idealistic, perfect representation. No bags under your eyes, no wrinkles, right? You were kind of just, you know, perfected in marble. Uh, Figures were either nude or draped in togas or robes of the day and age. Faces were very calm, right? Kind of expressionless, showing this kind of um, stoic strength to themselves. And perspective was interesting. So perspective is a technique in art that, may, that is used to make people and objects look closer or farther away to add some type of realistic depth to a scene. So if we look at this example here, uh, the, you know, the marble structure is very detailed, obviously, all of the muscle and the curvature and, uh, you know, his hair and, you know, uh, beard, everything is trying to go towards an idealistic, right, kind of uh, uh, viewpoint. But this is also a mythological uh, scene. Uh, and so, you know, the gods and goddesses and all of the half heroes of the day and age were kind of glorified in these type of um, marble structures. Uh, moving forward, right into the Dark Ages, the medieval art. And once again, we're going through all of this because we cannot understand uh, Renaissance art unless we can kind of compare it to what came before. Right. So medieval art. Uh, from around 500 to 1300 CE, CE meaning Common Era. Uh, so artists during this time uh, went heavily into stained glass windows, sculptures, illuminated manuscripts, paintings, tapestries. And unlike the Greeks and the Romans that came before them that liked to show the human form and incorporate their gods and goddesses and all of this you know, struggle of humanity, the medieval art, because it was so centered uh, w within Christianity, uh, wanted to show the relationship and devotion towards God, right? Because everything led to the purpose of devotion towards God. And so here we have some characteristics of the art form, right? Uh, you know, most of the art was religious. It showed uh, Jesus Christ, various saints, and different Bible figures. So once again, it was all centered upon the worship of um, Jesus Christ, of God, the Heavenly Father, uh, and all of these figures, right, um, you know, had little movements to them. The previous uh, slide that I showed here, right, if you're just viewing this at the museum, right, or back in the day, 
near a public square or somewhere famous uh, that people can view it. Like the movement here is very kind of dynamic, right? He's kind of twisting and turning and, you know, you could just tell that, you know, he's involved in the movement. He's being attacked by the snake, right? Um, for the medieval art, things were a little bit more stiff. And I, I'll show an uh, example here, right? People were more stationary. They were not in heavy movement. They were a bit more uh, kind of uh, stoic in their thought and their prayer towards God and the Heavenly Father. Uh, and so, uh, you know, faces were a little more serious, had less expression. Some of them were two-dimensional. Um, although, if we're talking about um, not, let's say, statues outside um, on the church or cathedral, uh, but if we're talking about stained glass windows, which I have an example, oh, I guess I don't have an example here, but if any of you have seen stained glass windows at a church, um, it is a beautiful representation of um, kind of, you know, uh, these bright and vibrant colors, uh, you know, showing different biblical scenes, but it's very kind of two dimensional. There's no depth in it, right? It's just on a pane glass window, stained glass. Um, and if anyone wants to view a beautiful stained glass piece, I recommend going to the Huntington Library in Pasadena. Um, in one of their rooms, there is this enormous, probably around a 15 or 20 foot tall stained glass window, and it's absolutely gorgeous. It's like in a tiny chapel, right? Uh, and then let's move towards Renaissance art. So this Renaissance art uh, around, you know, 1400 to 1500 started to, uh, you know, come out of the medieval period, come out of all of the God worship. And they started to, uh, you know, relearn all of the Greco-Roman styles of art and sculpture and everything else. Um, and they got heavily into painting, right? Uh, and so painting, philosophy, literature, music, science, right? All of it had just this explosion of information. Uh, artists created, you know, sculptures, murals, drawings, uh, etc. And the purpose of this art during the Renaissance period was to show off people and nature mostly. Uh, not necessarily just religious ideas. So the idea through the medieval ages that God is the end-all be-all of life and that everything you do or paint or sculpt should be to uh, you know, worship His grace and His majesty. Uh, the, you know, the Renaissance art started to uh, show the importance of people in nature more so. Uh, they showed, uh, yes, they did show religious scenes, but also non-religious scenes as well. Kind of getting a close-up look at, let's say, a mother and her baby. Um, you know, something that had nothing to do with religion, right? There was no presence of God or halos or anything um, in there. It was just to, let's say, um, you know, the artist would see this beautiful scene and say, well, I want to, you know, just show a mother and her child dynamic, right? This is beautiful. Um, figures now looked more lifelike. They were three-dimensional. So if you're looking at the painting, um, it has depth. It has perspective to it. And it has bright colors. It has people is showing people doing just random, ordinary, daily tasks, right? Not worshiping God at the altar and having this huge ceremony and religious ritual, but just showing everyday tasks. Um, and all of these different artistic styles that they were uh, practicing with was showing depth, perspective. Uh, so in the sculptures themselves, they started to uh, go back to that Greco-Roman tradition. On the left-hand side here, we have a centaur, right, being mauled by a hero. On the right-hand side here, we have the statue of David by Michelangelo. Um, as you can tell, right, still kind of going into kind of that detailed description of their muscle patterns, their figures. Um, even on the right-hand side, if you look at David's uh, hand, right, his various tendons are shown very realistically. Uh, They'd really try to capture right the the uh, uh, the human body and spirit, uh, the creation of man by Michelangelo again right in the Sistine Chapel. Um, this did intertwine uh, God uh, and kind of religious aspects into it, but it also glorified man as well, uh, mankind, humankind, uh, showing off the glory of their body and their curvature. Here, the creation of man, Adam is seen as. Um, you know, almost touching, right, God uh, in a very kind of beautiful scene. And God is surrounded by these kind of angelic figures. 
Uh, and then there is some discussion because this is the uh, Renaissance after all, and the uh, development of human thought, philosophy, innovation. Um, on the right hand side, if you notice, you know, in the background, that kind of reddish, you know, circle thing. Uh, if you start to strip away the figure of God and the surrounding angels, or so those angelic figures, uh, it looks closer to the shape of a human brain, which is fascinating. And so some uh, philosophers are looking at, you know, these paintings and critiquing them and saying, well, this could be Adam or man in general, humans, uh, kind of contemplating their role within the universe, their role in relationship to God. And if since God is represented within this brain structure here, uh, perhaps I am God, right? Perhaps my own conception of the universe is all that matters. And so these are radical thoughts during this day and age, because once again, we're coming out of the church days, out of the medieval ages, where the church says, God exists, you have to worship Jesus Christ. If you do not do what we say, you will burn in hell forever. And the Renaissance now is kind of experimenting with some of these different ideas and thoughts, um, which is just fascinating to see. Um, we start to go back towards the day and age of uh, Socrates and Plato. So the school of Athens, right? Um, painted by Raphael, um, depicts, uh, you know, uh, such figures, right, from all of the philosophical histories of ancient Greece. And so once again, all of these, uh, you know, beautiful works of art and paintings are, you know, showing that Greco-Roman heritage and culture kind of coming back to life. And if you notice, the way that they started to paint all of these scenes, as you're looking more and more in uh, towards the center of the uh, painting, you have this depth and perspective, right? So the way that they are painting these scenes shows that, uh, you know, this is a large expansive room. Uh, and as you are getting closer towards the center of the image, right, it kind of the, the building stretches further and further, giving you this kind of awe inspiring look that you are looking into something that is, uh, you know, having so much space to it. Uh, let's move on to parts two, Italy's city-states and rise in trade. So as all of Italy and the surrounding regions are having this resurgence of culture and knowledge, we have various city-states that are benefiting from said knowledge and also uh, you know, trade is crucial at this point in time and this junction, uh, the trade between the East and the West, right? The silk trade, uh, the silk road, um, all of the naval uh, trade routes going from Europe and the Mediterranean all the way to Africa, the uh, Indian Ocean, the Philippines even. Uh, and so trade and commerce really started to brighten up. And these bustling new economies were created uh or establishing these large prosperous cities. So as you might imagine, trade increases globally around the world that allows for uh, various cities to grow immensely in their wealth. Um, and that equals eventually, right, because we're talking about the Renaissance and artwork um, and these philosophers. Eventually, these wealthy cities um, have individuals that are wealthy enough to become patrons to donate money to the arts, right? So if I am a very wealthy uh, patron of a very wealthy family because my family was involved heavily in trade or whatever other type of good, uh, I eventually can donate right, money to your cause and say, listen, uh, you are so uh, talented in whatever it is, sculpting, woodworking, um, building projects, whatever. Uh, I will fully fund you, go and work, right? Uh, and so we just have this explosion of artistic thought and creation. But this trade between the East and the West uh, was happening over the last few centuries, uh, going as far back into the Crusades. Uh, there was all of this interaction between Europe, the Byzantine Empire, right? The Eastern Roman Empire that we were talking about, and especially Muslim cultures in the East. So there's uh, this is a completely different kind of subtopic or different class entirely that one day I hope to teach if I can make it happen. But um, the history of the the Middle East and the rise of uh, Islam is fascinating. 
uh, after the rise of Muhammad, for centuries, we had these large and powerful uh, caliphates, right? These large Muslim uh, empires. And so when Europe went into their medieval age period, right? The quote unquote, the dark ages, uh, the Muslims were enjoying vast amounts of prosperity, trade, um, innovations in mathematics, architecture, agriculture, right? They were on top of the world. Uh, and so in addition to the Byzantine Empire maintaining the Greco-Roman culture, uh, the Muslim caliphates also retained a lot of the mathematics and the building uh, and all this other wealth inf of information. And so by the time the Renaissance came to fruition, and all of these various trade routes are crisscrossing around the world. They are starting to get people and architects and mathematicians from all around the world that kept all of this tradition and knowledge, right? That benefited the Italians directly. Uh, so, you know, why reinvent the wheel when you can just, uh, you know, borrow it from your neighbors? Uh, eventually, the Mongolian conquests, right, through Genghis Khan and the Mongols was also spreading wealth from China um, in, uh, in terms of goods, but also ideas and thoughts and building projects and currencies, uh, banking institutions and the rest. Marco Polo famously had a great interest in the East. Uh, and on all these travels and endeavors, um, we, you know, was stopping by these major cities, uh, thereby further growing this, uh, you know, large interest in trading with China. And so we had these large cities with grandiose trading routes formed, such as Venice, Genoa, and Florence, right? And so the, the main purpose of all of this was that, you know, as these cities were starting to uh, be built, as certain traders and merchants and families were gain, uh, gaining an extraordinary amount of wealth, uh, these cities started to expand immensely. And so we started getting uh, individual city-states, that were expanding uh, to great amounts of power. And these city-states, uh, well, first off, let's describe what is a city-state. A city-state is a, an individual uh, polity and system of power that is not necessarily completely adherent to, to the larger nation, state, or empire at B. A city-state is semi-autonomous or sometimes fully autonomous, depending what era of history we're talking about. Uh, but they exert a great amount of influence, right, in their surrounding lands. And so various city-states such as Florence or Venice or Genoa began, began to grow in such prosperity and military influence and uh, art and intellectual influence that they began to rival some of the empires themselves. And so what factors led to some of these cities, such as in this slide, right, Venice, the Venetians, uh, rise in population, uh, population was growing and people started to flood towards these metropolitan areas, similar to even now, right, these large cities across the United States, New York, Los Angeles, Chicago, people migrate towards the cities, uh, especially when times are hard and they need work. Uh, all of this money and finance was being just, you know, uh, brought in at extraordinary levels. Uh, and so these building projects of cathedrals, governmental buildings, public squares, and, uh, and more started to really bolster up these city-states and build up this reputation. And so these cities started to grow their commerce, trade, their banking institutions, and the uh, formation of credit, right, and credit loans uh, started to get formed. Uh, and so, you know, these cities definitely were putting themselves on the map. And so Venice itself went from a sleepy kind of canal water town into this bustling, uh, you know, trading, intellectual, cultural hub of Italy, right? Uh, and, you know, you could walk the streets and have people from all around the uh, Silk Road, um, and from the Middle East and from Africa, right? All kind of trading alongside one another. Uh, and so once you start to have all of these different peoples and ideas and cultures and innovations, right? Kind of just intermingling with each other. The host city, such as Venice, is going to benefit and prosper in the end. Here's a modern day picture of Venice, right? And their uh, canals. Interesting to note during the COVID uh, 2020 uh, fiasco, that we're still uh, dealing with. 
Uh, remember the first like two, three, four weeks, right, of the lockdown? Um, you know, at least in Los Angeles, uh, I would go outside and all of the smog was gone. The skies were blue. Uh, Italy had the same thing. Their skies completely cleared up, and most importantly, the canals they used to hear started to see dolphins come back because the canals were no longer uh, dirty and being used, right? So nature kind of just came in and washed everything and cleansed it. So um, I can't imagine being a local Venetian today and just randomly seeing dolphins for the first time in your life within the canals, right? That's pretty crazy. Here is a, a map and image showing uh, some of these trade routes that I was talking about, right? An Im immense amount of trade routes. So from Venice here, right, within Italy, you could see that they had access to all of the European trade. They had access to the Trans-Saharan trade in Northern Africa, through the Trans-Arabian trade, throughout all of the Middle East and the Arabic and uh, Caliphate, um, you know, uh, uh, powers that be, right, the emp those empires in the Middle East. Uh, they had the enormous trade routes of the Silk Road on land, right, whether through horseback, through camels, or anything else, stretching all the way towards India and China. And if they had uh, access to uh, the Red Sea and getting their ships through the, the uh, Isthmus, uh, they could sail all the way down to the east of Africa and going towards India and the Philippines and China as well. So as you can tell, there's an enormous amount of trade of goods, of spices, of knowledge being transferred here. Uh, and so Venice and other city-states uh, within Italy greatly ended up growing their uh, intellectual prowess here. Florence. Florence is another city-state to look at. Uh, it was a leading cultural center during the Renaissance, often nicknamed the Cradle of the Renaissance. So if Venice was the uh, financial, you know, banking institution of Italy, Florence, I guess, can be considered the, uh, uh, you know, uh, cultural hub as well, and also benefiting from some of that trade and banking uh, and wool institutions from Venice as well. Uh, but, you know, some famous examples from here were Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo, Dante, um, Alighieri, uh, and you know all of these famous figures, right? That had the advantage of having some of these Florence, uh, you know, major uh, patrons, right? Donate towards their uh, projects, and so Florence was also at the center of all of this great trade, uh, and was in contact with the Silk Road and all of these kind of you know trade routes, navally or on land or anything else. But they were very, very famous for two things in Florence their banks and their wool. So the banks uh, were formed uh, at this time and the entire concept of banking and of credit systems and money lending was huge. If you could imagine yourself, because today in modern capitalism in 2020, um, if you are the head of a major banking institution, uh, you are swimming in money and gold, right? Uh, this is obviously you know, kind of hindsight is 2020, but if you were able to go towards the very beginnings and foundations of the banking industry, right, like Florence and here, uh, you know, the wealth is going to start to grow uh, at an accelerated rate. And so, so much money was starting to go in and out of the city. Uh, the wool trade was giving them an immense amount of income, but also the banking institutions and the loans and the financing that they started to implement as well gave them long-term investments and long-term uh, loans and rates. And so, you know, I will be glad to loan you some money, but it's going to be on a 5% or 10% uh, interest rate. And so many of them were just making money off interest. Uh, and so one of the famous families that we're going to look at later in a little more detail is the Medici family. And, you know, these guys were immensely wealthy, became one of the most wealthiest families in all of Europe, but families such as the Medici and many others, not just them, uh, began to invest into the arts. And so it became uh, a mutually beneficial relationship between the patron, the person giving the financial backing, and the client, the person who is receiving the financial backing. So it is 
uh, mostly it is usually called a patron client relationship um, which also has a roman uh, heritage right going back towards the uh, caesars uh, but you know they began to use this patron relationship so uh, if i am that the wealthy medici merchant or of another you know prestigious family i will give you all of the financial backing that you need in order to make your sculpture or your painting or uh, make the Sistine Chapel a reality or whatever else you need. Uh, and it was it was mutually beneficial because if you create your, you know, masterpiece of a work, whatever it could be, whether it's the Statue of David, the Sistine Chapel, whatever, you as the artist have the immense joy to say, this is my work that is forever immortalized in the city, right? I have the uh, utmost joy to say I am the one who was the patron of this work, right? So my name is also going to be forever immortalized. And the fact that I funded it uh, gives me even more uh, societal gravitas because I was wealthy enough and successful enough to make this happen, right? So it was very much so a mutual endeavor. And here is an image from Florence, right? A very famous uh, image. Uh, and if anyone has ever played Assassin's Creed, uh, you know, two or three can, uh, you know, remember probably scaling the, uh, you know, various buildings here in Florence, right? And jumping off into a random haystack. Uh, so if anyone remembers those, um, you know, various kind of missions, or if any of you are into, you know, video games, your brothers and sisters are, uh, definitely comment um, and say something because I would love to um, see how many folks still remember that. But, you know, walking through any of this architectural marvels, um, this is part of like, in, uh, uh, this could be within individual houses if you were wealthy enough to have some more of a estate or some of the governmental buildings as well. Um, statues, artwork, littered everywhere. Um, all of these Corinthian columns, right? Uh, going back to the Greco-Roman heritage as well. Um, all of this artwork, right, kind of coming together. Uh, speaking of uh, architecture and buildings, uh, the sheer amount of engineering and architectural prowess also increased during this time. Uh, we started to see that, uh, you know, because they were studying the Greek and Roman ruins, right, as time went on, uh, we started to get uh, straight columns, arches, domed roofs. If I go back to the previous image, all of the columns here, right? If you can see my cursor moving, but all these columns are from the Greco-Roman heritage. The little kind of ruffles up top, right? The leaves um, it denotes the uh, Corinthian style. The arches here, instead of being a very rectangular um, kind of archway, right? Not even, well, not archway, but instead of being a rectangular kind of shape, uh, it does not distribute weight as effectively or evenly and so the arch can distribute the weight right much more uh, gradually and with ease um, and so they started to kind of bring back all of these wonderful innovations um, you know various palazzis or uh, Italian for palaces began to grow uh, so images such, such as this right these private townhouses, these private locations of a family that would live here and could afford these courtyards and all these statues and arts in it. Uh, all of the humanists at the time, the members of society that began to say that uh, we need to uh, better appreciate the human form and human thought and philosophies and everything else, um, they started to appreciate big open spaces Right, because it allows the citizen and the individual to really be engrossed into the architectural, uh, you know, sphere. Right, in order for them to feel that they are truly included in what is going on uh, in the city, whether it's a private palazzi or whether it's a more public forum. Uh, the most, one of the more famous figures, uh, the architectural figures in Florence, is the Santa Maria del Fiore, and that is the image that we saw here. And so we're going to see a little more in depth um, of this uh, famous building, but uh, it is, you know, definitely one of the main uh, attractions of Florence even today. Um, but for the longest of times, the architects uh, Filippo and others they did not know how to uh, build such a great cathedral without all of that 
um, excess weight crashing down on the cathedral. Uh, and so over time, they were thinking about it and thinking about it and drawing after drawing, uh, not being successful. And then eventually, Filippo, he found the answer, which is to make this large dome on the right hand side that we can see an actual dome, right? And so by making the dome this the shape that it is, um, the weight is being equally distributed. And at the very uh, top, um, you can distribute the weight uh, even further by making it a bit uh, lighter. And we'll see some images uh, soon. But the way that Filippo came across this problem is that he was studying ancient ruins of Rome itself and all of the ancient Roman buildings. And he uh, relearned that mathematics were heavily involved in building all of these ancient Roman buildings. So, you know, in the year, uh, you know, uh, in the 1400s, uh, trying to read all of these ancient texts and materials from a thousand or more years ago. He understood that, wow, the Romans had all of this mathematics involved in the building of their buildings. Uh, we can definitely benefit and learn from this. And so his dome did not use any supporting beams at all or columns, just stone arches with a few items to keep it all in place. So just from the shape and the structure itself, it was able to distribute the weight so freely. Uh, and here's a beautiful aerial shot of um, the top of the dome and of the surrounding uh, city of Florence. I have yet to visit uh, Italy and Florence, but it is definitely on one of my top uh, choices for travels. Um, hopefully once uh, you know, our situation in uh, 2020 in the COVID crisis uh, kind of dies down a little bit um, and trade and um, uh, flights open up for travel. Hopefully I can come in. But just for scale, for you to understand the sheer scale of it, at the very top of the dome, you can see people standing, uh, you know, uh, standing with the rail there, right? Kind of viewing it from the um, perspective from the top. It is an enormous building, right? A true marvel of uh, Renaissance architecture, right, at its finest. Um, and so standing closer towards, I guess, the ground level, right, we can see the various uh, buildings, we can see the um, actual dome um, over there in the background, just an absolute beautiful uh, city, the architecture being uh, bustling and having marble and all of this knowledge and architectural prowess, right, involved. And even throughout all of these um, you know, uh, cathedrals, right? We can see all of the different statues and all of the, um, you know, realistic expressions on their faces and the toga. So all of this information and wealth of knowledge uh, has been used and culminated into uh, making these beautiful cities. And if you were to walk inside the Santa Maria, it is so beautiful, right? And remember, we were saying that the humanists wanted these open spaces, right? Uh, this is as open of a space as it gets. You walk into, you know, the cathedral and you are just enamored with the openness of the space. Um, so open that you could just yell, right? And it kind of echoes, echoes, echoes. Uh, and so, you know, the, uh, especially at the top over there, um, we can see that there is, you know, beautiful amounts of artwork, right? Um, paint, painted on. And so it gives you a perspective if you are looking up that it is, you know, kind of going towards the heavens. So yes, there is this, uh, you know, religious aspect to it, but it's a bit more humanized, right, than before. So, you know, in past uh, decades and centuries, uh, instead of just having an, an, uh, an icon and a figure, uh, you know, of just an angel or a cross, and then you just worship, right? Uh, not having a clear kind of representation, right, of what an angel would look like or such. All of these figures are in 3D dimensional um, styles. And so we can kind of see this scene of heaven and, you know, angels in the clouds kind of come alive, right, if you will. Now, uh, I can't show this video once again because I'm not, I am not sure how the YouTube algorithm is going to uh, treat this. However, um, if you have time, please watch um, Rick Steves' uh, video here where he goes inside of the Santa Maria del Fiore and he details all of the beautiful 
uh, artwork and all the gold that is painted uh, inside. Uh, Rick Steves is this legendary figure uh, who travels Europe and he has these large textbooks, uh, not even textbooks, but these large kind of traveling guides, if you will. Um, I was in France, in Paris, uh, two years ago, uh, and my cousin uh, gave me this huge Rick's, uh, you know, Rick Steves book for France, detailing everywhere you need to go, uh, all the sites, uh, tourism, where to stay, where the great food spots are. This guy travels and he has, he's living the life. I'm pretty sure he has one for Italy as well. I would not be surprised. He has one for like all the major countries of Europe. Uh, but yeah, he de this video is only like four or five minutes long. So if you have an opportunity, please uh, look at it. And it you just feel, especially if you put it onto full screen on your computer or your tablet or anything else, you really feel, you know, you feel tiny and small walking into this grandiose space, right? And so he does a great job of portraying that. Now, this is um, the halfway mark. Um, so I have another two parts to go. Um, I will keep uh, moving forward uh, into parts three and then part four. But if you want to pause it here and take a break, this is the halfway mark. So uh, feel free to pause, come back, grab a drink of water, um, and I'll be here as soon as you um, hit play again. But uh, otherwise, I'm going to kind of push on and trudge through for part three. So humanism and philosophies quote-unquote, coming alive. So the growth of humanism. So the humanistic thought in this day and age was growing immensely. Uh, humanism was the stance uh, and values of uh, human beings, right? Their individuality and also their collectiveness. But the study and the value of humans themselves. Uh, because once again, for centuries in the medieval period, uh, the number one goal or association of society was to collectively worship God. Everything you did was for God and for his glory. But now in the Renaissance and the humanistic um, revolution or change or however you want to describe it, it started to put forth human beings, um, you know, more into the uh, theoretical uh, and philosophical spotlight. So your entire life is not merely just determined on your love and worship of God. It is now also, um, you know, giving you uh, agency as a human being. And so this thought was rising in Italy uh, due to all of this, once again, Greco-Roman culture coming back into fruition. And so these humanists were absolutely ravenous and hungry for ancient books, coins, and any other type of artifacts that they could learn about the ancient world. So, um, you know, just like uh, the building of the Santa Maria Dome, um, where uh, we had the architect looking at all the ancient Roman ruins, the humanists were trying to scour any scrolls or wealth of knowledge from historians or writers or poets of the ancient world, uh, and so we ended up getting, you know, all of this beautiful Latin and Greek texts. Uh, Francesco Petrarch is considered the founder of Italian Renaissance humanism. He was a very well-known poet and he scoured all of Europe for all of these old books and manuscripts and uh, scrolls and such. And so he began to have this large collection of ancient Latin and Greek texts. And also after reading them, started to ask himself the important questions. Uh, what was most beautiful about the human body? Um, how did the Romans construct all of these various buildings? What is our relationship with God, the afterlife, and how do our actions decide our fate? Perhaps that last question is the most uh, prudent and important of the three, especially when we are detailing the relationship of all of these various people and artists and sculptors and humanists and philosophers, etc., coming up in this day and age, and not adhering to what the church wants. Because we cannot underestimate the power of the church at this point in time. They were intertwined into everything. And so, not too long ago, 100, 200, 300 years before this, people were burned at the stake and executed, right, for being heretics. Because the church did not like the way that you were speaking your mind on certain views because potentially those views would 
be going against the worship and belief of God. And so now that people are studying all of these various, uh, you know, ancient texts, and they're coming up with these, you know, critical questions and ideas, like what is our relationship with God? 200, 300 years ago, if you ask the priest, well, what's my relationship with God? He would just say, it's to worship. And if you don't want to worship, you're going to burn at the stake. Uh, and so, you know, critical questions. And for any of you uh, thinking of, you know, majoring in anything in the humanities, uh, the humanities were created during this time, right? The central kind of foundation of it being a focus of study on human life, on culture, on history, on literature and ethics, etc. Right? This is a history class. So obviously, this is well within the uh, grandiose umbrella of humanities. Uh, and so if you have any interest, right, in all of this, this is the kind of beginning of the hum uh, humanism and humanities, right, section of society. So Mr. Petrarch that we were talking about, right, kind of the, kind of the master of the scrolls, if you will, um, he originally studied law, um, just like his family and his father wanted him to do. However, his passion was for literature. Uh, for any students in this class or watching this video um, and you are around the college age uh, range, uh, some of you might be uh, living this same type of life where your parents are telling you, nope, we want you to go into law, medicine, be a lawyer, be a doctor, make the big bucks. But, um, you know, perhaps some of us can relate to Petrarch because he said, you know what, that's not my passion. My passion is for literature and I love to read. And so his major passion was Greek and Roman texts. And so, uh, you know, he started to devote his life to that. And after his father passed away, um, he f uh, left law entirely and began to focus on the classics, on the Greco-Roman heritage and traditions, and thankfully so that he did. Otherwise, uh, you know, the, the Renaissance and Western Civ would not be what it is today. Um, in conjunction with uh, our conversations of humanism and the humanities, it is also very prudent to also discuss individualism. Because in Western civilization, even in the present day, various governments and civil liberties and constitutions always kind of points towards an individualistic basis, right? That every individual has some type of right towards um, happiness, uh, uh, peace, prosperity, pursuit of happiness, etc., right? Um, that you need some type of protections against some overruling, you know, uh, tyrannical type of government or anything else. And so the humanists began to think about all these power structures at B as well. So I guess once you start allowing human beings and humanists to sit at the park and uh, eat and drink merrily all day, they started to think about the powers at B. And so they began to really consider the relationship between the church and the state and asking themselves, does the church have the right to rule, right? Do they have this kind of God-given gift of bestowing upon us what they think we should do on a daily basis. And so the beginning of the separation of church and state has begun here, uh, which we can see into the modern day and age. Obviously in the modern day and age, it's not perfect, but that's a completely different class for modern US history. But let's say if we're discussing what a normal person's life in the feudalistic age would be, right, the medieval ages, uh, you were born into a class and you lived in that class. If you were born as a merchant you, uh, into a merchant family, you would be a merchant. If you were born into a blacksmithing family, you were a blacksmith. If you were born as a peasant and a serf toiling the land, that is what you were. And so now in Renaissance times, society now was prizing you more for your thinking and your accomplishments and merits and less so on your family heritage. And this is a, an enormous foundational shift in um, culture and perspective because it allows the flexibility for you to prove yourself and for you to 
you know, demonstrate what you know and, you know, your skill set and how hungry you are for work or for proving yourself in any type of manner. And so just because you say, oh, I was born into this wealthy, prestigious family, um, that's not going to matter as much so anymore. Now they are going to say, oh, you want to paint in this famous school of art? Show us what you got, right? Um, and so the individualistic belief system that an individual's achievements um, were weighed much more importantly now. And so the humanistic, the humanists and the individualists started to conflict with the Catholic Church, as you might imagine. Because the church was, for the longest of times, teaching that laws were made by God. And those who broke these laws were sinful. And so they taught people to follow the laws without question. Because if you question the laws and you went against the man-made laws of the Catholic Church, you are therefore going against God. And if you are going against God, you are a sinner and a heathen. And sinners and heathens are going to be labeled as heretics. And heretics are going to be either jailed, imprisoned, tortured, beaten, or executed. And so it was a very kind of one directional kind of line of train of thought there. Uh, the humanists on the other, other side were looking at all of this and saying, yeah, we're not exactly agreeing with this. And so they believe that people should use their minds to question everything, right? And they tried to balance, they still did, they tried to balance their religious worship and belief with this newfound emphasis on, uh, you know, th heavily thinking and critiquing life and the afterlife. Because once again, most of these folks, they were born into the Catholic Church, right? They were worshiping Jesus Christ and God since they were children. And so they did try to balance the two. They were not necessarily just kind of reborn atheists, right? Uh, but, you know, even this kind of any slight deviation from what the church is uh, mandating for you, it was still seen as a threat to the church structure at B. Some advances in painting. So, uh, and we'll talk about the Medici soon enough, but uh, the Medicis were, you know, of course, spending enormous amounts of money, right, on palaces, paintings, statues, etc. And a lot of the Renaissance painters were now being influenced by these humanists. They were reading their works, they were conversing with them at the pubs um, and, you know, uh, you know whatever, wherever social meetups they had. And so now, these famous painters that once were just, you know, given these assignments of, I want you to paint Jesus Christ and these uh, angelic figures with halos on their head. And they're like, okay. So you're doing that for years and years and years. And then they started to interact with these humanists. And the humanists said, well, you know, life is beautiful. Uh, even, you know, in a simple kind of uh, moment of let's say a mother cradling her baby or something like that it has nothing to do with religion no Jesus Christ and there are no halos no God it is just a mother and her child right and so these painters started to listen to these humanists and back and forth and they started to slowly but surely start to switch and change their painting um, to better express human emotion human suffering uh, various uh, landscapes and so Yes, they were still painting occasionally, right, those uh, wonderful, big, grandiose religious works, right, because it depends what the patron wants to pay for. But uh, a lot more realistic settings for characters were now included. And so this, uh, you know, per, uh, perspective, right, uh, was created and perfected even more, right, whether it was discussing the height, the depth, the width, position of the characters in the work of art. And so the ways to create various lines of perspectives were to change the size of objects, indicating that they were closer or farther away, um, or shading figures and objects to give it some more depth or realism. So here, um, in this famous work, and this is more of a religious work, but the styles are still shown here. So if, you're, if you are, let's say, looking at the lines of the ground, right, this ground looks very kind of marble-esque, right? Um, the different lines, that the, the way they are uh, painted um, in various kind of uh, differentiating lines gives you this depth perspective pointing towards this uh, entire plane is very wide and expansive, that the buildings are 
you know, situated further, um, you know, uh, or, you know, pretty far from each other. They're not necessarily just like literally, you know, two inches away. Uh, and it does add that little bit extra a bit of depth. The shadows um, of the figures and of Jesus Christ and everyone else sitting uh, here and standing in the front details that there is some type of depth and perspective to them standing there. So the artistic styles are definitely um, evolving, right, as time goes on. This is a good one. And this shows all of the various lines that you should be looking towards to, to you know, achieve that depth look of that perspective look. So this painting itself goes from the left to the right. And the further you keep glancing to the right side, the buildings in the far right are kind of slanted and going down and down and down. And so the eye naturally notices and sees that, oh, that's farther away, right? And so all of these advances in art uh, you know, are being utilized for additional depth and perspective. And so these artists are, you know, kind of really going into having this um, additional freedom, right? Um, and of course, they would be painting and, you know, making different artworks in these large, expansive uh, rooms, right, and areas. Uh, so all of this together, right, was culminating uh, at the same time uh, in the Renaissance day and age. Uh, sculptures and large form art. So sculptures were also influenced by humanists because of their interest in realism. It was also inspired by Roman statues being dug up. Because once again, the Greco-Roman tradition and the Roman statues had a very realistic um, view of people, right? And their muscles and their tendons and their veins and whatever else. So they wanted to really encapsulate all of this and take it to the next level. So for the first time uh, since the Greek and Roman period, these statues were now freestanding. And so many of the Greek and Roman uh, statues, typically, let's say, towards the, the legs or the heel, um, they needed a little bit of a supporting joint, right? This random thing that just like stuck up into the person's like calf, but it was there to support the statue. Now, they were making these same type of statues even more realistic, but on top of that, they needed to have a fundamental understanding of balance and weight. So if the character is doing something crazy and holding something or about to throw a disc, you needed to shape them in such a way that the statue itself was perfectly balanced and can hold its own form. You didn't need you did not need something randomly just sticking out and supporting them. And so um, Donatello was a, a Florentine sculptor who was one of the first to use a realistic life-like style. And he created a life-sized statue of David, right? The very famous statue of David that Michelangelo later would be attributed to. But Donatello used a life-sized statue. So I'm six foot, and so let's say the, the statue of David would be six foot. Michelangelo took it to the next step. He made it a 17-foot monster statue of David, right? Completely just towering. And so... Uh, you know, this kind of personifies the high Renaissance, right? Uh, where they try to take all of these Italian and Renaissance and Greco-Roman traditions and they put it forth onto a whole new level, right? Perfecting their work. And so Michelangelo took the statue of David and created a 17-foot version of it. The uh, statue of David is detailing the young warrior of uh, in the David and Goliath story, right? In the Bible. So once again, it is... Like we said before, a lot of these artists are still intertwining some of this biblical aspect to their work, but you know it is from a more modern perspective, right? The uh, characters have so much more detail to them, and so the statue of David, right, the seventeen-foot, uh, you know, just megalith, right, of a creation, uh, you know, it's highly detailed. If you look at his. Uh, his right arm or to our left um, going down the biceps you can see uh, specific veins going down um, once again in his hand you can see various kind of tendons and veins going down as well all the musculature going in now at the very bottom uh, for his right foot you do see a support brace there um, because at the time I'm guessing he had some difficulty making the 17 foot statue version of it right and having it be freestanding so 
um, even the best, right, sometimes still tr struggle to make it the freestanding structures. But um, definitely a, you know, huge, uh, huge just accomplishment and something that is still seen to this day. Uh, Michelangelo uh, also attributed to the famous Sistine Chapel, right? Uh, you know, took him years to finish and complete this uh, beautiful uh, piece of work and all the various scenes within them and all the many different paintings and landscapes and tapestries and such. But, uh, you know, we can still see that, yes, at this day and age, some of the patrons are still paying for these religious uh, scenes, but they are now more three-dimensional. We can now see that, you know, op walking into this open space uh, that makes you feel so small within this grandiose, uh, you know, area, looking at all of these different... Um, uh, all these different paintings and scenes, uh, you know, and there, let's say, uh, you, know, you know, portraying some type of big landscape, right? And having some depth and perspective to them. It's kind of just like viewing an, its own kind of window, right, into this scene. It's not just two dimensional and that's it. You can really kind of look into it and get lost and engrossed in it. The creation of Adam. Right, very famously, we're discussed about that. Is seen here as well. Um, Leonardo da Vinci's Last Supper was also a famous uh, work detailing at the time as well. And so, although not using the uh, perspective and the depth model uh, nearly as much, uh, now we are also kind of seeing the more humanistic side within biblical stories as well. So here we have, uh, you know, uh, Jesus Christ's Last Supper, uh, and we have Judas sitting uh, at the table, right? And so this is supposedly supposed to be a scene where somebody tell, you know, Jesus Christ says, well, one of you is going to betray me. Uh, and then everyone is kind of d talking and discussing, uh, you know, well, who, who can that be? And so this kind of aspect shows that more humanistic uh, influence, right, on the artwork. Because now... Uh, we see that uh, there is this push towards, you know, showing human emotions and human struggles and tragedies, right? Right within these types of works, it is not merely showing Jesus Christ painted in gold with a halo up top and just kind of having his hands free, floating towards the sky, right? Kind of just saying, "Worship me." Now it's showing this kind of very human scene of an individual telling right his disciples his friends whoever um one of you might betray him and everyone's kind of like what you know what's going to happen and so all of these things right definitely interesting to study and look at uh this video is great um this is approximately nine or ten minutes and it is a renaissance art summary it is from two doctors um experts in the field of art history and they detail some of these famous italian renaissance artworks some of them that we discussed um today right and uh, they go through and detail a lot of the perspective images the images of God uh, and Adam and the uh, how the Renaissance painters and sculptors were trying to depict multiple uh, things both intertwining religion and their humanistic uh, uh, new found kind of beliefs and it, it's a great conversation it's a great little piece uh, a nice little summary so for anyone that wants a little 10 minute recap Definitely watch the video. All right, here we have the Renaissance man theory. Or I guess it should be, I guess, renamed Renaissance person theory for more modern contexts. But if you've ever heard the term, oh, this person's a Renaissance man, um, that's where all of this stems from. So during this period of time, the high Renaissance. It was a short period of time where all of these powerful Italian states, um, especially in Rome, uh, the Papal States, Florence, Venice, um, during the Italian Renaissance, they were at the epitome of their artistic production, right? Leonardo da Vinci, Raphael, Titian, Michelangelo, they were all uh, producing these beautiful and famous works, right? And sometimes competing against one another for fame and glory. Uh, but, you know... A lot of these individuals, because they were lifetime scholars and they had the 
very wealthy patrons, right, to donate money and to support and provide for them. Uh, they were termed the Renaissance man, or also known as the polymath, or the quote-unquote universal man. And what this signifies is that you have an immense amount of knowledge in multiple subjects, uh, drawing across all of these different breadths of studies, uh, you know, to solve specific problems. And so, you know, the main ideal here was that it embodied the basic tenets of Renaissance humanism, uh, where men and humans are the center of the universe, are limitless in their capacities and development over their lifetimes, and that they should try to absorb and embrace as much knowledge as possible. So, for example, if you are excellent at literature, um, a true Renaissance man would say, you know, it's great that you're, you know, very well adept at literature, but you should also try to be well adept at mathematics, sports, medicine, law, sculpting, etc. Right? You can be pretty good in multiple areas of your life, not, not just necessarily being an expert in one. Um, one of the perfect examples of this during this time was Leonardo da Vinci, right? A very famous figure that most people have obviously heard of. Uh, and so he was a polymath um, to the greatest of extents. Um, it is recorded of him having knowledge within drawing, painting, sculpting, architecture, science, music, mathematics, engineering, literature, anatomy, geology, astronomy, botany, paleontology, and cartography. Whew, that's a mouthful. So he definitely personified right these kind of tenets. Um, here on the left-hand side, we have his drawing of a perfectly proportioned man, the Vitruvian man, uh, detailing his appreciation of the human form and anatomy, but also of mathematics and science, right? Kind of detailing it in a perfect uh, sphere, a perfect circle, um, and trying to show the geometric shapes and the geometric kind of proportions of the kind of perfect um, body. Um, all of his drawings on, uh, you know, babies being born, fetuses, um, anatomy of both men, of women, of his inventions, of perhaps people flying one day and being in flying contraptions. Uh, you know, he really kind of embodied perfectly the idea that um, somebody could research and be, you know, good and uh you know, kind of forever study throughout their lifetime, multiple subjects and areas, not just necessarily one. So if any of you are um, always debating to yourself, oh, well, you know, what am I going to major in, right? Because I'm really good at a few different majors. Um, you're definitely not alone. <laughs> Many people always kind of have that difficulty trying to find their major or, you know, path in life. Uh, da Vinci had this lifetime pursuit and money flowing in for all of his work, so he was able to study it all. If only that were the case for all of us, right? If only all of us got a grant for, I don't know, a million or two million dollars, and we could all just study whatever we want on a daily basis. And here are some of his uh, famous works. We have the Mona Lisa on the left-hand side. Um, and on the right-hand side, um, we have a, a uh, an image of a lady with a uh, oh, I, for, I forgot how the uh, specific name for it is. It's a eunuch, I believe, something like that. It's like a sort of ferret, like um, ferret-like creature. Uh, but fun story about the Mona Lisa painting. We've all pretty much seen or heard of the Mona Lisa, this famous painting of Leonardo da Vinci. And two years ago, when I was in Paris and I was at the Louvre Museum, uh, I thought this was going to be this, you know, nice, big, kind of gl glorious painting, right? Because in history and through art and through common uh, culture, right, everyone knows of the Mona Lisa. And so we started getting closer to, this, to the room where the painting is housed, right, where she sits. And, you know, it was just packed, so packed. It was the most packed, crowded room of the entire museum. The museum is large. Uh, and so I noticed that the painting was just super tiny. <laughs> it was guarded and under, like, multiple plates of glass and all of this stuff. Probably bulletproof with, like, you know, machine gun turrets just pointing at people. Um, but 
yeah, it was it was it was smaller than I thought it would be in person. I, I couldn't even get close to take a picture, right, and to kind of appreciate it up close because it was in one room. There was literally like a hundred, hundred twenty plus people. It was just it was insane, um, and people were like just elbowing each other, right, trying to get closer to the painting. But you know, even here we can kind of see, um, you know, small individualistic pieces were also uh, becoming more important during this time for Renaissance painters and these humanists, right? Uh, not necessarily these grandiose religious uh, figures or halos or Jesus Christ involved, but, you know, let's say on the left-hand side, Mona Lisa sitting next to a, uh, a landscape, right? Um, so definitely uh, a product of the time. Here we have some of his uh, Leonardo's various sketches. Um, also trying to detail the uh, curvature of the face, of the muscles, um, how uh, the human body and anatomy works, how different joints are going to operate as well. So you can just see how much work is being put into this. Uh, you know, detailing a child's, uh, you know, face, right? And the different kind of curvature and the lips and all of the, the nose and the eyes and the curly hair. Uh, or even on the right hand side, right? How is the perfect method of trying to draw a hand at rest, right? And so all of these different things uh, we can kind of pick up on. All right, powerful ruling families of Italy and patrons of the arts. So here we have the Medici family. I promised you we would be getting to the Medici and here we are. So the house of Medici. They were an Italian banking family and one of the strongest and wealthiest political dynasties during this time period. Um, they began to uh, grow in prominence under uh, Cosimo de Medici in the Republic of Florence um, in the first half of the 15th century. They were extremely rich and powerful because of two things, their uh, wool trade and the banking industry that they set up in Florence. And so with their uh, vast wealth, right, pouring into the family, they were able to build palaces, maintain a very powerful army, and were involved in almost all aspects of the city, right? They were becoming the bosses and the political moguls of the city of Florence, indeed. And, you know, they were also becoming great sponsors of artists, writers, and musicians. Because once again, it's a mutually beneficial relationship, the patron-client relationship. Um, the, the client, the artist, receiving all of the funding that they need to complete their beautiful work of art, but also the patron, such as the Medici, uh, gets the added benefit of saying, I was the patron of this glorious artwork, right? And immortalized respect and glory will come to me and my family because we were the ones who uh, made this a reality. And because of their enormous wealth, obviously, more, more money, more problems, right? And so other rivals were consistently trying to steal their wealth. Um, and so eventually, after 300 years or so, um, they were starting to fall from prominence, right? So uh, Lorenzo the Magnificent, he was one of the leading patrons of arts and scholarships, uh, ruled Florence for more than 20 years. Uh, and a couple of years later, revolution forced the Medici into temporary exile, right? Right before they hit 1500 CE. Uh, regained power uh, in 1512, right? A few years later. But as we can tell, even a powerful ruling family system, Medici, were not exempt from political espionage and rival uh, families trying to usurp the quote-unquote throne of the city and the territories, right? Ah, Machiavelli. A truly Machiavellian story will be told. So, politics in Florence. So, if any of you have been following recent politics or even politics in the last couple of years, uh, as you are growing up and going into college, most of you demographically are what, 18 to 22, 23. Obviously my classes age range kind of depends and it's all over the place sometimes, but for the most part, let's say if you're the college student age range, 
um, you are starting to notice that politics is a really greedy game. <laughs> it is not a fair game uh, at all. Uh, and so Niccolo Machiavelli understood this very well. He was a historian, right? A man of my own heart. He was a historian who wrote The Prince. So he watched the struggle for power in Florence. And during the Medici's exile, he reorganized the city's defenses and served as a diplomat for various Italian rulers. And he used all of his culminating experiences and observations to write The Prince. Now, this book, very revolutionary for its time, detailed how politics and government really worked. And so the corruption, bribes, relationships, moral character that it took to get into power, the enormous amounts of greed and backstabbing and whatever else, he detailed as much as he could of all of it. And so instead of the traditional kind of historical texts, I guess, that we were getting from time periods before this, uh, such as, well, the king came into prominence and God be with him and God save him, right? And just kind of a very nice little rhetoric. Machiavelli came in, you know, swinging. He's just like, this is a greedy person's game. These, these folks are slitting each other's throats, sometimes figuratively, sometimes literally. Uh, and so, you know, it was a great observation of politics and government and that it was a it was not an idealized version of it. It was, you know, getting into the nitty gritty uh, aspect of it all. And he, uh, he also uh, was detailing, uh, you know, the differentiations between city states and republics in his works. Um, and so we talked about this a little bit before towards the beginning of the lecture, but um, the city-states, right, were, you know, becoming uh, highly powerful. Uh, but, you know, what is a city-state and how does that uh, differ, right, with republics? And so the Renaissance, as we were talking about before, was beginning in Italy because of all these powerful city-states. Venice, Florence, Genoa, uh, you know, coming into prominence. And so the city-states are independent cities that are so wealthy and powerful that, you know, they can be autonomous. And so traditionally, those included cities like Rome, Athens, Carthage, etc. Uh, and so after the Middle Ages, going into the Renaissance, all of these city-states were now, you know, coming back into fruition. They started to become actual viable centers of power, influence, and authority. Um, however, the republics were still, right, great forms of government still. Uh, Florence was a republic of its own, having elected representatives to rule for the people. And so although not perfect, even the United States today, right, we have a republic. Um, you know, although it is not perfect and elected representatives sometimes might not be ruling for the best benefit of their constituents, uh, republic still gives more flexibility to society than let's say a kingship or a monarchy where one person is destined under god and given a divine authority to rule um republic is still a very viable form of governance uh just a recap on some of our city state discussions theoretically republics give power to the people um because your you as the people elect your uh, representatives and they're supposed to rule on your behalf uh, but for all of these city-states because these various merchants or let's say members of let's say the Medici family became so enormously wealthy uh, they started to wield an enormous amount of influence so very similar how today we're in a republic but let's say if we're talking about uh, I don't know any multi-billionaires Bill Gates or Bezos or most importantly probably let's say the Koch brothers um, who pour millions and hundreds of millions of dollars into uh, government and legislation and bribing congressmen and such uh, they have an enormous amount of influence and so here we're also seeing that you know wealthy families over time were gaining more long-term control of various boards guilds and governments and so although at times some of these city-states might have on paper a very, um, you know, Republican form of government, right? Uh, 
you know, still some families like the Medici's were getting so enormously and famously rich and wealthy and pouring money into art, culture, government, banking, trade, that they started to get their tentacles and wrap it into every fabric of the city and the underlying region. But there was also a lot of good that came from that, right? There's always two sides of the story, two sides of the coin. So on one side, somebody could say, well, these, these various families and these merchants were so greedy and powerful, they were uh, ruling with almost no impunity. The other side of the coin was, although wealth was gathered at the top in the hands of a few, uh, they poured money into building universities, hospitals, buildings, statues, paintings, etc. They funneled their wealth into all of these cultural, uh, these cultural, medical, uh, scientific endeavors, right? And so they were feeding into the Renaissance machine itself. Uh, here we have the Medici family, right, presented in various uh, paintings. Wealthy bankers, wealthy uh, wool merchants. Uh, there's nothing like a wonderful uh, painting portrait with a good suit of armor, right? If only we could bring that back, right? All you Game of Thrones fans, if you like to see some good armor cosplays. And our last part of the lecture of the series, Renaissance literature. So, on top of everything we discussed, Greco-Roman culture coming back and being studied. Uh, we studied uh, and looked at different art artistic works, paintings, sculptures, architecture. We looked at humanists and how they were rethinking uh, the relationship with themselves, with society, with God, with the church. Uh, we were looking at trade and different city-states growing in influence such as Venice and uh, uh, Florence and all these rich families like the Medici, right? Uh, and now let's get a little bit into Renaissance literature. Uh, obviously, all of this is not a complete uh, encapsulating lecture and view on you know, any of these issues, right? Um, the Renaissance itself could be an entire class, just the Renaissance getting so deep into all of these uh, things but yeah you know, this is a nice little generalistic overview right of the renaissance and if you go back and watch all of the videos in this lecture and more it'll give you that much more of a kind of overall breadth view of all of our discussions here but as we talked about in the last number of slides uh the renaissance was you know, beginning in the 1300s, moving on into the 14th, 15th, 16th century. Uh, and as trade was growing, cities grew, money was flowing, artists and writers began to be uh, uh, funded, right, by various uh, patrons, and they were the clients. Uh, and so the sh amount of educated people was growing, it was rising. Uh, more people would study more than one field now to gain knowledge because everyone wanted to be a renaissance man. Um, they did not necessarily want to just be an expert at one thing. They wanted to uh, really kind of spread their wings and be, let's say, like the next Leonardo da Vinci, for instance, right? Um, and so following that same term of renaissance man, renaissance person, right? Uh, people wanted to try and achieve to the best of their ability to, let's say, go up to the level of Leonardo da Vinci, to be the next great intellect, to be somebody that could be a painter, scientist, engineer, musician, and architect, all wrapped into one, right? Obviously, much easier said than done, but uh, it's a great aspiration to uh, try to reach. And now that we're talking about literature, we cannot uh, meaningfully talk about literature without discussing the Gutenberg Press. Uh, for any of you that had world history in high school, you perhaps might remember this famous Gutenberg Press, and you're thinking to yourself, dear God, why are we talking about this again? It is very important. It is highly important, the Gutenberg Press. Uh, as the Renaissance started to spread in Italy and spread you know, across the borders into France, Germany, Belgium, Holland, England, and Spain, and such, all throughout Europe. Um, cultural diffusion began to promulgate all of these ideas through trade and travel and education, um, as did, like we were talking about with Italy. They were gaining wealth of knowledge from China, India, 
the Middle East, Africa, right? All of these areas of the world was kind of propagating into Italy itself. And so as Europe started to become the benefactor of all of these various amounts of knowledge, uh, people were starting to get hungrier for reading, right? For knowledge. And Johannes, uh, or Johannes uh, Gutenberg, who was a German inventor who approximately in 1450 uh, CE developed the first printing press with movable type. What the heck is movable type, you might ask? So movable type is uh, if you have little kind of little characters, right, with different letters, you can pick them up and interchange them. So you can start to make whatever text you want so that you can print it on a piece of paper uh, and rearrange it and reuse it as much as you need to. And so this was absolutely revolutionary. Uh, this was revolutionary to the point where, let's say, the Internet age for our generation has just been as revolutionary. So previous to uh, Johann's work, uh, any book needed to be handwritten and hand drawn by monks. That is a very uh, time intensive endeavor, if you might imagine. Like if I gave you a two, three hundred page book and I said you must write this by hand and draw it and uh, you know, put all of these beautiful gold chips and illuminated manuscripts on it. It takes a very long time. They're beautiful pieces of work, to be sure, but um, very slow um, and kind of propagated only throughout the very wealthy of Europe for centuries. Because as you might imagine, a handwritten made uh, book by a monk that took them like a year or something, a year and a half to make, um, it would be expensive. Now, Mr. Johan comes in and says, well, I need to make this a little faster and more affordable for the masses. And so, uh, you know, it could take, let's say, four to five months or more, depending on the skill level of the book and how much artwork needed to be inside of it, to, let's say, make a 200 page book if it was handwritten by a monk. Johan now came and could print a 300 page book in one day. And the most important also part of this is that even if he makes in a single month, right, let's say if he makes 30 books in the month, they will all look identical, right? And so now you have this wonderful homogeneous amount of wealth and knowledge being spread throughout uh, Europe. And so this completely changed the game of literature, of reading, of education, right, throughout Europe. And it made education much more affordable and readily available for the masses. Uh, oh, these two videos here, uh, the one on top, uh, I recommend to watch. It's kind of like a History Channel-esque vibe to it, uh, detailing uh, Johann Gutenberg and the entire process of him developing the printing press. And on the bottom is a more modern day uh, print printing press version, and he actually details how the entire process unfolds, uh, gives some historical background on it as well. Um, but it's really cool actually seeing a modern day example of a Gutenberg press of putting down the specific movable type, getting a very old school, uh, I'm not even sure what it's called, but it's like this really round absorbent material that you can blot the uh, black ink with and you kind of roll it around the movable type, right? Um, and then you firmly press it down and you create your um, you know, massive sheets of written word on paper. So definitely very interesting to watch um, and worth your time as you are going back through these slides and kind of looking over them. Uh, but this is what a typical, uh, let's say, printing press, uh, you know, factory or office would look like. Uh, you know, multiple people working on it. Um, whether it's on the printing press machines or let's say on the movable type side and kind of being the person who rearranges all of the specific words um, for whatever the pages are going to be for that day. Um, the person um, all the way in the back with those two little round globes, as you can see, that is those uh, absorbent uh, materials that you can kind of, um, you know, put a bunch of ink and absorb the black ink and then he's rolling it on the movable type so that when you put the movable type on paper the ink can actually stick to it um, highly fascinating and it completely revolutionized um, once again education and reading throughout Europe um, because now instead of books and knowledge being 
very rare and hard to come by and expensive. Now they are readily available, cheaper, uh, and would benefit anyone. Um, they can start printing Bibles at extraordinary rates. They can start printing uh, works of philosophers and writers and mathematicians also at enormous rates. Um, and this would completely change uh, not only Europe, but the Middle East, Africa, and surrounding regions as well, as they too would eventually get their hands on some types of printing presses and future iterations of printing presses. And different governments would start to uh, grapple with the, with the ideas of um, the written word. And we're going to get into this more heavily as we're going through our chapters this semester, especially once we start getting into, let's say, like the French Revolution uh, and how different monarchies and despots and the Russian Empire started to grapple with um, revolutionaries and terrorists uh, printing their own versions of what's going on in the nation uh, and, you know, uh, printing their own versions and thoughts of what government should be, right? And so this is a huge monumental shift. So I think I... I think it's a fair comparison to make to the modern day and age where let's say technology and especially let's say social media um, is just as a revolutionary uh, you know uh, change as the printing press was for them uh, even today with all of our Black Lives Matter protests the George Floyd protests etc social media is an instant uh, instantaneous very fast method of informational travel that you know, millions of people can now read, right, in an instant, as soon as something posts, um, which is something that all of our future generations and uh, forefathers could not say the same thing about. Uh, but it's definitely, definitely prudent to look at these moments of history and understand their significance uh, and just how impactful things were. So as we're moving forward into the chapters, remember the Gutenberg Press and remember, uh, which eventually are one of the themes is going to be the power of the written word, the power of the press. Now, let's look at a specific type of work. Let's look at the Divine Comedy by Dante. Uh, Renaissance literature in general started to become more and more interested in individuals, right, themselves. Uh, as we were discussing about the humanists, uh, and all the Renaissance painters and sculptors and all of these artists, right, working throughout um, their cities and getting money from their patrons. Uh, they started to write in literature, right? They started to write about more secular topics, not necessarily <clears throat> uh, religious ones. So what is secular? Secular means relating to earthly life rather than religious or spiritual matters. So let's say for centuries before this, the monks of Europe, who were the keepers of knowledge of the written word, would write about religious matters, would copy down the Bible, right? Things of that nature. But now we're looking at more secular works, um, and people are writing about theories of, you know, just the modern day and age, uh, of life, of... Let's say uh, when Machiavelli was writing about the politics of Florence, right? Things of that nature, not necessarily just speaking about God and our role to worship him. Uh, and so as Dante is writing his famous work, The Divine Comedy, uh, it grows like you know, a forest fire. Um, his poem described uh, his imaginary journey throughout the afterlife and wrote about the inferno, a place where souls go for punishment after death for one's sins. And then he, you know, real people were modeled here. Uh, Dante wrote the people he didn't like and sent them to the inferno or to hell. Uh, the people he did like, he wrote into Paradiso, right? <laughs> and so it's a wonderful way as an artiste, as a, as a writer of literature, right, for you to uh, send the people that you like to paradise and send the people that you do not like to the inferno. Uh, this is a wonderful video if you have the time to watch it. This is from a Ted Ed uh, section. Why uh, should you read Dante's Divine uh, Comedy? And so uh, definitely, uh, if you have around 10 minutes of time, uh, give this a watch. This is a fascinating little uh, clip. 
and it can give you much more uh, in-depth perspective, right, on all of this. And so the Divine Comedy itself became, you know, an enormous, uh, enormously influential work, right, as time went on through the centuries. And you could just tell how much beautiful imagery is going into all of this. On the left-hand side, uh, we see all of the poor souls kind of beaten and tortured and punctured and all of the uh, gargoyle demon-like figures with pitchforks behind them, right, kind of prodding them along, just saying, ah, you know, get, in, get into the fire pit. Uh, we see, um, you know, versions of Paradiso, um, you know, behind them on kind of the mountain-like figure. Uh, and so, you know, there is all of this kind of beautiful discussion of, uh, you know, what the afterlife should look like. Um, the right-hand side is a very famous uh, image. And for anybody that has ever seen Tom Hanks's movie... Um, or has read the Da Vinci Code, um, you might recognize this. So it is um, describing the different uh, kind of levels of uh, hell, right, if you will. And these are the different various circles of hell. And so here, this is the Dante's Inferno, right, kind of describing the uh, different levels. So instead of, let's say, the, the traditional Christian uh, viewpoint of just there's earth where you live if you're good and you die you go to heaven if you're bad and you die you go to hell right there's just three planes of existence uh, Dante as far as the um, hell version is giving uh, much more detail he's giving um, he's giving nine different versions uh, or levels of hell the first one going from the top, because as you can see, the very, very top is grassy, has some, you know, kind of uh, uh, brush and trees to it, right? So that's supposed to be the mortal plane, right? Earth's plane. Um, and like, as you go down into the various levels, um, you know, you can kind of see the differentiation. So the first level is limbo. Um, and so this is for unbaptized and virtuous pagans. Um, it's not heaven. But as far as hell goes, it's not that bad. It's kind of like the retirement community of the afterlife. Um, so, yeah, it's not that bad, but still. Uh, the second level going further down is called Lust. Uh, this is the uh, second circle of hell uh, and is the final destination of the lustful and the adulterous. Basically, anyone uh, controlled by their hormones. Uh, so if people like Cleopatra... Um, people like uh, Helen of Troy were amongst the most famous residents during Dante's day and age, so perhaps he modeled some of them into this. Uh, the third circle was gluttony. Um, today's, uh, you know how some people, um, you know, love to have their Instagram feeds full of carefully lit photos and they love to have all of their likes and comments and stuff. So anyone that is completely gluttonous for... Um, uh, let's say fame or fortune uh, would get placed into this this mix. Um, fourth circle, greed. The fifth circle, anger. Uh, going even further down, heresy, violence, fraud. And the ninth circle, the most treacherous of them all, was for treachery. Um, so this was the uh, final circle in a frozen wasteland, right? Occupied by the greatest of the most treacherous people. Um, so it's it's just a fascinating look, right? Like if you could imagine centuries before this, if Dante was able to write something like this under the powerful, watchful eye of the church, they would say, are you saying there's other levels of hell instead of just hell? Sinner, her heretic, we're going to burn you at the stake or torture you until you say that you were coerced by witches, right, to write all of this. But now that society has kind of evolved and morphed into all of these humanistic ideas and kind of opening up their minds to all of these different ideas. Um, it's fascinating to kind of look at all of these. Uh, and so, you know, with that, um, that will be the end of our discussion here. Um, it's approximately, what, an hour, 45 minutes into the lecture. So good, good span of time. Um, and I will upload uh, the nation states uh, uh, lecture pretty soon after this, but uh, the, as far as the Renaissance chapter goes, um, there's so much more to the readings, 
um, you know, that get into far more detail, right, than the lectures here. Um, this is a kind of overall encapsulation of most of the topics. The online text gets pretty, uh, at times, aggressively detailed, right, as some of you are going to find. But, uh, you know, read through and skim as much of that as you can. And, you know, at least my lectures here are meant to take all of that overwhelming information and hopefully can consolidate it into an hour and a half or an hour 45 or something of more digestible material for us, right? Uh, so I hope you liked the lecture. I hope it was fun, informational. Um, if you have any tips or ideas for, you know, future lectures, um, let me know. Um, but thank you for being here. Thank you for taking the time to watch this. I really do appreciate it. I'm putting as much hard work as I can into my slides um, and to having, you know, good audio and visual, uh, visual quality. Uh, for the class. So um, hopefully it's appreciated. Um, thank you for being here. I really do appreciate it. Um, and see you on the next lecture.